Isaiah 58, 9 says, Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. Yes. A couple weeks ago, in prayer, the Lord was confirming to me again what we've been called to do. And he told me this is the power plant. This is where we come power stays with us, but this is where we come to recharge. Yeah, yes. But the power can't stay here because the power needs to go into the power lines to the communities. Yes. 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 And so we are the power lines that take the power to the people. Yes. Because in this next season of life, there's people that don't know Christ. Yes. So come here, cry out, reach out to him, take advantage of his presence, Amen. recharge your batteries. Let your faith be increased. Let the word of the Lord increase your faith. So when it's time to be out there Monday through Friday and Saturday, that it's easy to do the work of the Lord. Because your batteries are charged. We're, we're the power plant. All of a sudden, um, I, I talked to our leadership team about that on Wednesday, and I told them that's going to be our vision moving forward, and that's what I'm going to preach about in a couple weeks and then I listened to Pastor Jason Sisko that same day and he talked about the power plan yes, yes, and I thought man I, I, I made Jenny listen to it and I said I didn't hear this first yeah. this is confirmation I, yeah. this is crazy this is like I, you know but I love it at least I know God is speaking to me yes. and I'm in that same God is so good, isn't he? God is so good. Thank you, Jesus. Our hope has to lie in him. Does the next president matter? Sure, it matters. But our hope has to lie in him. Father God, we love you. One of my most favorite people. You know, when I was going through it, I was going, I had to go to the pastor's office. <laughs> multiple occasions. And when we were driving there, my dad said, well, he might kick you out of church. <laughs> no, I did some stuff. And I said, wait, that's a thing? People kick, you get kicked out of church. I didn't even know that I would be up for that like that. And when I got in there, it was just, it was God's, it, the love of God that's portrayed through my pastor. And uh, he spoke life to me, life transformation to me. He gave me some grave warnings. You know, because I had my son bouncing on my lap. He was four months old and he said, you know what, what you're doing is going to affect him. And I didn't want that. So I had to change, but he believed in me, you know. He, yeah. did, he yeah. didn't throw me out. He showed me the love of Christ like nobody ever had. Amen. Amen. I remember that. <laughs> Just so good to be here, and I, um, I cherish, I cherish my time um, when I'm here. I really do. I get a chance to see people I haven't seen for a while. Some faces I'm, I really don't know, and I'd like to get to know you better. And some people from, uh, from where we pastored before, and uh, some people that uh, really have established themselves here. And when I'm, when I, when I'm here, I, I have to tell you, you do, it does something to me. Yeah. Something happens here that happens no place else. If you don't mind my saying this, why don't you just be seated for a moment. And, uh, and I would say it's this, and that is that this church uh, throws formality out the door. Amen. Amen. Not order. God is a God of order, but God is not, an, uh, not a God of formality. You get to the point where we can, you know, we can become so rigid, and I just feel more flexible. I'm almost take, going to take my notes and throw them away. I could wax elegant for about five minutes, but, uh, but I'm glad to be here, and it's good to see some friends here and... Uh, 
Praise God. I want to talk about something that is really my favorite topic. And uh, I shared that with somebody, and they, they said they pinpointed exactly what I was going to talk about. I said, I'm going to talk about grace. And the reason that it means so much to me. I was in my 20s, and I had already spent half of my life going to church, and I went to hear a, an evangelist, a young man by the name of Irvin Baxter. Oh, he wasn't an, he just an evangelist. And he preached a message on grace. And he realized, I've never heard this before. More than half of my life going to church, and I never heard a message. I've read about grace. You know, you read the scriptures, you, you go over it. But a message about grace. Grace, and it it changed my life. Thank you, Jesus. And I, I, I don't even, I won't even begin to say that I could accomplish what he did with that message for me in your lives, but I, but I just want to share something, something that I think is important to know about, about grace. Amen. Amen. My grandma had... Uh, and she was good for sayings, you know, little quips of wisdom, you know. She would say, many hands make work light, yeah. you know. I mean, now, centuries, for centuries, these little uh, words of wisdom have been spoken, and, and I know that you've heard a number of them. I'm sure that you remember them. How about a, a stitch? In two times, saves nine. <laughs> They're right. How about this? Absence makes a heart grow fonder. You've heard these before. <laughs> How about this one? People who live in glass houses should <laughs> There's another one. Related to something that, that Paul said, and if you'd like to stand for a moment for the reading of this word, this is going to be our text. I'm taking it from 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 1. And Paul writing to the church. I want to emphasize that Paul is, is writing to believers. Okay? He's not writing to people that are not in church. He's writing to the church. And he writes, We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you, not to receive the grace of God in vain. The old time saying, by the way, the one that I, I want to connect to this is actually the title for this message. And the title of it is, Waste Not. Praise God. Jesus, we love you. But thank you for what we feel in here. We feel your presence. We feel more than your presence, though. That's, that's so powerful. I, I realize, Lord Jesus, already you've begun to do things. You did things in people's lives already before this message. But there's something else that we feel, and that is we feel your love. We feel your love that just flows between members, and that's you. And I ask, Lord Jesus, as you're here, dear Lord, listening to these words, that you'd help me. Lord, to communicate, to convey, Lord, a thought from your word that can minister to the hearts of every person that's here. And for that, Lord, we're going to give you the praise and the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Waste not, want not. You know, the meaning of that is that if we don't waste things, then we'll always have what we need. There's a lot of waste that takes place. I think about one thing we, we generally waste a lot of, and that is time. Yes. Anybody here? I, 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 I fall into that category. Amen. I did some, some calculations to figure out, you know, after we take care of our responsibilities and our needs, typically, in a week's time, we've got about 20 hours to do other things, other worthwhile things. And uh, I know that many people, as well as myself, don't always take advantage of that. 
much of that time is wasted. Something more important, though, something far more valuable, something far more meaningful, something that we need even more gets tragically wasted. It comes from God just like time does. And it's grace. And it's grace. Paul pleads with the Corinthians and he said, he said, don't receive God's grace in vain. Don't, don't let the grace that flows out, the grace you receive, don't let it come to nothing. Don't, don't let his grace, don't allow it to be, to be wasted. Grace is, is amazing, isn't it? <laughs> you know, if you wonder a little bit about what grace is, grace is the, is the favor. It's favor yeah. Amen. that God shows to us, not, the, not because we deserve it. God knows we don't deserve it. The frequent definition for, for grace is the unmerited favor of God. He, he gives it to us just because of one thing. He gives it to us because He loves us. Yes. He loves us. Yes. That's something everybody needs to know. Steve Kiley is a, uh, he's a chaplain in a hospital and he walks into rooms many times when lives are just devastated. They're going through the most tragic circumstances. They don't know him, he doesn't know them, but he walks in and he begins telling them, I'm a chaplain. I'm going to be talking to you for a little while. I'd like to say some things that would be helpful to you. But there's one thing I'd like to say, and it's the one thing is something that I, I want you to remember. Don't, if you forget everything I said, don't forget this. Please remember this. Please remember this. God loves you. God loves you. And he's here for you. God Grace comes to us, by the way, and, and, uh, and it comes to us in so many different ways. I'm reading from the 103rd Psalm. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all their iniquities, who heals all their diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, yes. who satisfies your mouth with good things, yes. so that... Your youth is renewed like the eagles. Yes. Grace is a lot like... That favor that we get from God is a lot like manna. You know, the Israelites, they went into the wilderness and were hungry and, and, and God met their need. He met it, he met it every day. Whatever whatever is necessary, whatever's, whatever is needed, I want you to know something. God is willing and able and desiring to do something for you, to yes, help you. Amen. Amen. Imagine that, that manna that was falling all around them, but imagine that they wouldn't use it. Imagine just, and, and if they left it out in the field, guess what? They couldn't go back later. Why? Because it was, it was spoiled. It, it was wasted away to something else. They, they couldn't store it. They couldn't take it and you know, keep it for tomorrow or, or for next week. You know, you see, God wants, he wants us to know he loves us. And he wants to do things for us every day when we need him most. And I will say this, each day it's not going to be the same amount. Some days are a breeze, aren't they? Yes. And some days that breeze is a storm in our lives. When Paul prayed about a problem in his life, what did God say? He said, my grace. <laughs> my grace is all you need. My grace will take you through. My grace is sufficient. He goes on to say, he said, my power, God said, my power is made perfect in weakness. You see, when we need him, God really demonstrates, yes. does he not, Amen. his love. When we go through a struggle, God's grace is always enough to take us through. And some, sometimes we conflate mercy and grace. We listened to Pastor Rob that he talked about mercy. 
And, um, and I, I know sometimes you think, well, th I think they're like the same thing. I think, well, actually, they're not. They're quite different. Mercy, mercy is not getting what we deserve. That's right. And grace is getting what we don't deserve. But the reality is, as you could put them together, the reason I say that is, is mercy is God's grace to us. Yes. And what does the Bible say? It's renewed every morning. Yes. This is what it says. This is in Lamentations. It says, steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Let yes. me say that again. His mercies. We deserve the worst. Yes. That never happens. It doesn't happen. It never comes to an end. It goes on to say, they are new every morning. Great is your faith. Praise God. <laughs> this coincides with God's greatest favor, though, to us. When we think about God's grace, there's no greater demonstration of God's love than the fact that God saves us. Yes. Remember, I said this is something you do on your own. Ephesians 2 and 8 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works. Not by your efforts. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Lest anyone should boast. Lest anybody should yeah. mm -hmm. think that somehow they pull themselves through. Right. And this is why grace is so marvelous to us. No one can be good enough. That's right. And you think about this. You know, we work pretty hard to make a living. I mean, just to get by. I mean, we go, we work sometimes 40, sometimes even 60 hours a week just in order to make ends meet. So how much would you have to work to be forever in eternity with Jesus Christ? I mean, forget it. It's not possible but by the grace of God. Of God. Yes. And God's grace is attained by faith. That's all. The faith that God expects though from us. In other words, this kind of faith is not just mental assent. It's not just saying, well, I, I believe that God lives. <laughs> no, no, it's beyond that. It's beyond lip service. It's beyond words. You see, this kind of faith is, it expects demonstrable action. You've heard the story about the tight wire walker? Okay, and he's got some people in the audience that are watching him, and he takes a wheelbarrow, and he says, uh, I can make it across. How many of you believe me? And somebody raises their hand and says, good, get in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> God's saying grace is available even to the worst of humanity. In uh, Titus 2 and, and 11, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation appears to all men, everyone. <laughs> the worst of the worst, yes. the grace appears to them. I want to finish reading that verse a little bit later. Saving grace is only possible, though, by the death of Jesus Christ. Yes. The death, the burial, the resurrection, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, the obstruction to, to, for people when it comes to, to eternal life, and we talked about this just a bit later, I think Dave talked about this, and that is, it's, it is, it's sin. In Romans 6 and 23, we read, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. By nature, by nature, we are we're all sinners. <laughs> We are all sinners that are saved by grace. Yeah. It, all of us, all of us, basically had a death sentence on us. Every one of us. But because of God's love, he took care of our sin by paying for it with innocent blood. Amen. He became my substitute. Amen. He became your substitute. Yes. We owe a debt we couldn't pay. That's right. He paid a debt he didn't know. The summary of the Bible says it all in one verse. And that is, for God so loved the world. Yes. Yes. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish, mm -hmm. but have everlasting life. Mm -hmm. God performed the ultimate act of love for all, for everyone. But receiving it requires faith 
in Jesus Christ. And that demonstrable action, by the way, I was talking about the getting into the wheelbarrow, is experiencing something that he has for us. And it is the most marvelous thing. It is a brand new life. Yes. Yeah. How many people go through life just saying, How? Oh, I wish I could start all over. You can. Yes. Yes. You can. Yes. And it's called new birth. And what a beautiful example that is. You know, where we experience this new life, a new life. By being born again of water and spirit, we get this fresh start. Yes. And the beauty of that is I would say this. Yeah, I'd like to start my life all over, but I'd like to start it with some understanding of what I, I wouldn't want to go back. Right. And start as a baby all over again, come all the way through this. No, I, I can start with what I know right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can start with a, with a brand new nature. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 would be, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things pass away. Behold, all things become. That's grace. Yes, that's, that's grace in our lives. Many people have thought, I wish I could do that. All they need to do is receive God's grace. Yes. God loves us just the way that we are. I want you to understand it. He loves everybody. But he loves you way too much to leave you the same. Amen. Yes. Praise God. Imagine, imagine, imagine having a, a counselor with you every day of the life. You, sometimes I realize, and I, I think people, they just need some real professional help. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> this is beyond me, you know. And, and so, and, and if I was going to, by the way, some people say, you know, that we adv don't advise people to go to counseling. No, we, we think people could get counseling yeah. yes. and should get counseling. But make it Christian counseling. Right, yeah. yeah. Yes, you know? right. Make sure that the person has a, has a relationship with, with the Lord Jesus. Yes. Right. And, and then, of course, you're going to get some help. But imagine having that kind of counsel, though. In fact, even better counsel with you all the time. Jesus said that before he left bodily. He said, he said I'm going to send the counselor. <laughs> in fact, he went out and said, I'm going to be with you. So in other words, the counselor is with us all the time. So that's the new life that we have. A new life. A new nature. And God's Spirit leading us and guiding us. I said I was going to pick up that text. And I stopped. Going back to Titus 2. Where it says... It goes on to say, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us. Mm -hmm. Teaching us. Yes. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, yes. Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that we might be redeemed. He might he redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself, his own special people, zealous of good works. That's grace. Yes. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Amazing. Amen. God provides what we need yes. to be saved, but also to live the best life yes. ever. Yes. Praise Amen. God. John Newton's Amazing Grace, and I love that song. Oddly enough, again, here I'm hearing this message in my 20s. But for years I sang Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That grace that saves. I once was lost and now I'm found. Was blind but now I see. So grace finds me and grace enlightens me. It opens my eyes. But how appropriate John Newton went on and he put these words together. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. T'was grace that brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us home. How many of you heard the expression house money? I know you people that know the expression. I know where you learn that expression. For those of you that don't know, it's a gambling term. 
Okay? It's used when people are making bets, but not with their own money. <laughs> All right? It's money that they've received from the place where they're laying down their bets. It was gained. And so it's considered, now when they're playing with it, they're not playing with their own money. They're playing with house money. In a sense, really they've got nothing to lose. When you stop to think about it, and the reason is because they're not going to be out anything of their own. You see, and, and you forgive me if, if, if you this is out of place, but, but we've got house money. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not playing this with my own strength. I, I've got house money. I'm not doing this on my own power. I got house money. That's right. I, I, I go into situations, you know, and I realize, oh, I don't think I can. No, I got house money. I can take some risk. Why? I've got house money. I've got God's spirit. I've got God's power. I've got grace working in me. Praise God. There's another expression. It's also a gambling expression. It's called leaving money on the table. Now you can almost imagine what that means if you've never heard that expression before. It means walking away from a winning situation. Now a person, if you, it'd be crazy to do that. You, you know that it's a sure thing. And you put the money down. I mean, it's ready to pay off. And you walk away. Leaving Money on the table. Paul is saying that to the Corinthian church. Don't take the grace of God. Yeah. This, this new, never-ending life that you, God has given to you. That's right. yeah. And waste it away. Amen. The Spirit of God. Don't, don't leave that on the table. Right. Don't leave it at home when you leave. Amen. God, take it with you. And if you do... If you do, you will want nothing. You'll have need for nothing. Paul, excuse me, Peter wrote about those people who foolishly walked away. They became the slaves to sin. Again? After they were delivered. They were entangled now in the pollution of the world. For them, grace was received in vain. It was wasted. And that, that happened to me. That happened to me. I was baptized at a young age. I talked just a little bit about my life, the years that I'd spent in a church. I'd received the Holy Spirit. And then I left. I left. I walked away. I walked away from some of the most important years of my life as a believer of Christ. The, 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 the probably some of the best years that I that I could have spent with Jesus in my life. From the time I was 16 until my early 20s. Recently I was at a night of worship. It was uh, at LifePoint and, and they just happened to have on the platform all young people. Young people did it. They, they were the ones who conducted it. And, and, I, and as I, I looked at them, I, it gave me the fodder for this message actually. And the reason I say that is I was watching them, looking at them, and all of them were were in that age span where I was gone. And I'm looking at them being used, and, I'm, and I realize they're so empowered, and they're so bold, and they're so talented, and they're so gifted. Amen. And I thought to myself, I wasted! I wasted that time! I wish I had done more when I was younger. When you think about it, the young have so much to offer. Yes. Uh -huh. Maybe there's some young people here today, and I think about young people, I think about, they just seem to catch things faster. I mean, they learn faster. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Pick up languages and all that kind of stuff. You know, it, just, it just comes to them so easily. You know? they, and they're dreamers, are they not? I mean, they've got, a, they got plans for the future that, you know, they, they're thinking about being astronauts. I'm not thinking about being astronauts. <laughs> They're not burdened with past failures. We, we carry that around. Tried that. Didn't work so good, you know. They're not like, they have very few constraints. 
They're filled with energy and zeal and excitement. And I, I had all of that. I, I, I abounding with God's grace at that time. And I left it on the table and walked away. Yes. And I, I thought to myself, I missed it. I missed it. And then it occurred to me. I could waste grace now. Yes. Yes, you could. I, I, I'm at the point right now where I could say, you know, I'm, I'm getting up there in years. You know, I, I, I don't have the energy that I used to have. I'm, I, all these qualities that I, I don't have any of those qualities, you know. There's not a chance that I could do anything for God or I could be used for God. But if I did, I believe in all the experience and wisdom that I've gotten all over the years. I would be leaving gifts that God has given to me. I'd be lifting fruit that God has put into my life and given to me. I'd be leaving all that on the table. Why am I saying this? It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you are in your life. God can use you and desires to use you. Get your batteries charged here. Your instruments of God, get out there and communicate. Praise God. Remind myself, don't waste grace. Don't waste grace that God has given to me to be used for the kingdom now. I heard this neat story. This is a great story. I want to share this with you, and that is that I just came back from, some of you know Tim Chappell, and Tim Chappell has purchased a lot of land of northern Wisconsin, and he's created an environment, a homestead where People can come. It's a, it's a retreat atmosphere. It's just unbelievable. And so, and he's got a couple of people with him. Jim Dawson, if you remember him, he's, yeah. he's a Jim, I believe, it's, I believe it's Korean. I believe it's Korean, but he's Oriental looking. And he's, he's, he's rather unique right now. And the reason I say that is, you know, he has that dark skin. He looks a little bit like Don Malice there, you know. <laughs> but his beard comes down, like, right down here. Wow, wow. Okay. So there's a very... Well-to-do young man. He lives in the, the, that uh, Eagle River area. And uh, he installs piers. And he has a dream. He has a dream. And in this dream, there's an Asian-looking man with a long white beard. Oh, and he wakes up. It's just, he, he was just faced this image. It's only a few days later. Jim Dawson shows up at his house to do some electrical work, and he looked and he saw him, and he began to shake. He just, and he didn't know if he needed to get a gun. <laughs> because he didn't know what the dream meant. Right. Was this a warning? Yeah. And so he saw him here do the electrical work, and they begin talking, and Jim talks about what they're doing there in this area. Mm -hmm. And when he describes it, the man says, I want that. Mm -hmm. Would you take me there? He walks on the grounds and he starts crying. Mm -hmm. He just, he starts crying. Okay? And so they said, listen, why don't you come back on a Tuesday night? You know, we're going to be having a little Bible study here on, on the grounds. So he comes, this, his name is Tom. So Tom comes and he sits down with them. Now he knows nothing about the Bible. He knows really nothing about God. And so he's listening to them share and talk, and it was all done. They said, well, Tom, would you, is there anything you'd like to say? And Tom says, I, he says, I wouldn't know what to say. I know nothing about the Bible. I know nothing about, well, frankly, I, I know nothing about God. And he said, but, he said, but there, there is something that just seems to be going over and over in my head. It, it, Romans 8 and 1, does that mean anything? Tim Chappell gets up from his seat. He has a piece of paper with his notes, and on it is some notes, and he takes it around to show everybody that's in the room. Top scripture. Oh, Romans Jesus. 8 and 1. Oh, now, that's just how God's grace works, yes. but, but that's not the end of the story. Now, Thomas, Thomas, uh, what am I saying to you? It doesn't matter where you are, right. how long you've been here. Thomas, Thomas only had this much experience. And all of a sudden, he's in town, he's in Eagle River, and a bread truck comes up, and he walks up to the guy who's in the bread truck, and he says, he said, say, he said, uh, can I get some bread? I got some cows for the bread. He said, this is 
bread sugar cows. He said, but here's a couple of loaves. But I don't do this always. I'm a, I, I, I work in sales for the company that sells bread. The delivery, the delivery man didn't show up today. So I got in the truck to be here. Do you see what's happening here? Yes. Okay. So they begin chatting. They're about the same age. And Tom says, you, got, you can't believe where I was, this experience that I had. And the guy says, I want that. Right. Now here's a, here's a man that's not even born again. Right. And God's using him. Hello. Yes. Yes. Hello. Uh -huh. So Brian says, I want to go there. Well, Brian goes there to tell a story. And the story is that Brian comes from San Francisco. I'm sorry, San Diego. He had a 160 foot long fishing boat, and this was one of these, I mean, decked out boats, where very wealthy people would come and go fishing for bluefin tuna. And they would have a chef on board. I mean, this, this was luxury. And they, they had a crew of seven people. He brought somebody in to do some pyrotechnics, and there was an explosion on the boat. Somebody got killed. So there was a civil lawsuit, and he made a plea bargain. He had to give up everything he had. He could not fish in California. And so he calls his brother in Wisconsin. This, this is grace, folks. This is how God works. This is how God will work here. He calls his brother and he says, I need a place to stay. His brother says, come. He's halfway there. His brother says, don't come. He's halfway there. His brother said, I'm taking off with another gal. I'm leaving my family. Oh, and so he finished the trip, and he's now in Wisconsin. He doesn't know what to do, and he gets a job selling bread. Yeah. And so he says, I want to go to that place where you talk about. Mm. He walked on the grounds and starts weeping. Mm. And says, this is what I've been looking for. Mm. At times, we don't recognize God's grace because, well, frankly, it could be right in front of us. Yes. We, we just don't write. It's there for us. It's right it, you know, because it's not grace screaming, <laughs> this is grace. We don't think of it, but it's right there for us. God's word is like that. Yes. God's word is like, Amen. God's word is grace to us. Yes. You know, in the 119th Psalm, the longest one is 170 verse, verses that describes the word's worth to us. It's a lamp. It's a sword. It's food. Yes. It's, it's yes. so much more. Yes. What a waste to just have it in our homes and never open up the book. What a waste when I have a need and I can open up the need. And almost every time when I have a need to read something, God shows me yes. something. Something that I can share with others. Something that I need for myself. Amen. Yes. If he doesn't just have the God's word, you know something? He gives God's word to us in another way. He puts people into our lives. The Bible talks about grace gifts. Mm -hmm. yep. Do you know that there are five grace gifts, grace, grace gifts called the fivefold ministry? Yes. Apostles, pa apostles, uh, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. You know, you, you, I, I couldn't say this one time when I was pastoring a group of people. I couldn't say, hey, I'm your gift. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you need to listen to me. I can't, couldn't say that, but I'll say this. That's your gift right there. And that's your gift. And there are other teachers in this place that God has put here for you. Listen to what they say. Because if you don't, you're walking away with money on the table. Some in Galatia did that. They, they walked away because they thought, you know something, I think I, think I can manage this. I, you know something? I think I got the discipline for I, I, frankly, I, I think I've got, I have the willpower to do this. I, I can do this. They decided, I don't need the house money. I use my own money. Paul wrote to them in Galatians. He says, says he said, you've become estranged from Christ. That's right. That's right. You attempted to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. They decided that they tried to just get things, do things out there by their own power. Leaving out the presence of God and his gifts and his fruit. I, I, 
I see this in so many churches today. People coming in and checking the boxes, you know. Come every Sunday, check! I'm going to read the Bible. They put their, well, chapter in today. I did check, did it. Get my tithe into the church, check, did that. It sounds like grace, doesn't it? Sounds like the kind of thing that grace does in our life, but they're doing it on their own efforts, and that hard work will never be enough. They've fallen from grace. And soon it won't take long, and they'll realize, they, they realize, even if they're, they're putting in a facade, even if they've got that veil over their face, they know down deep inside that their self-righteous efforts are failing. They know that. Yes. They know it. They try to keep up appearances, but they, they basically, what they've done is they've walked away from God's grace. Yes. How, how do you know, by the way? How, how can you know? You know, there are people that are, I mean, they're going through those things, they're doing, they're showing up to church, they're paying their tithes, and so how, how do you know? How do you know it's grace? You could easily think, you know something, I, I think I'm doing, I think I'm doing this. No, no. You know, if, you, if you have that attitude, you're, you're in trouble. Yeah, right. You are, you are in trouble. Amen. I heard the song, Holy Water, We the Kingdom do that. It's a great yes, song. Yes, yes. And the bridge on that song, the, the, the person that sings it says, says said, um, I don't want to abuse God's grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever makes me want to change. I told you about that message I heard in grace. It changed my life because it made me want to change. I didn't say, no, I've got somebody to do all this for me. No, God did that for me. If he gives me grace, if he gives me house money, I'm going to invest it. Praise God. And so how do you know? And the answer is this. Those who have grace, those who are walking in grace, those who are utilizing God's grace, they have grace and they give grace. That's how you know. They are loving. They're at peace with themselves and with others. They're patient and they're kind. Their fruit can be seen in their lives. If you're exasperated or discouraged by your attempts, then it's your effort. That's the problem. Yes. Jesus. You're trying. Yes. If you're critical of those that are not measuring up around you, it's you. Mm. It's you. You're failing the main thing, the main aspect of God's grace, and that is love. I know what I said. I've been talking about my favorite thing, and somebody said love, but they're connected to one they another. Are, yes. Yes. They're connected. When we receive God's love, we re we have love to give away. Yes. Praise God. Amen. We love because the Bible says he first loved us. And I know that many versions of that say we love him because he first loved us. By the way, that him was not in the original context. But it's true. Yes. Nevertheless. But that whole context, that whole chapter was about loving others. We love. We love others because God's grace has filled us with his love. Yes. Yes. Praise God. Paul talked about love to the Corinthians, and he said, you can do all kinds of good things. You can. And guess what? It's all, it's all meaningless. You can give till it hurts. You can pour yourself into ministries and make all kinds of sacrifices, but it amounts to nothing without love. That's what he said. When God's grace is at work, we love others. Perhaps the strongest evidence of grace is that. That I don't care what people do to me, I'm still going to love them. Yes. So Paul makes this point. He, he says this. He said, Ephesians 4 and 29, he said, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification or building others up, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit that's in us. We have this house money. Why would you grieve that? Praise God. By whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, and there's so much of that in the world today, isn't there? Yes. You look around what's going on, it's so it's amazing how divided 
in awful things have gotten. Yes. Yes. Be kind to one another. Go tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Mm. We should be known for, for love. We should be known for our kindness. Yes. God shows grace to us by pouring his love into our hearts. And, and now it's a responsibility of ours to go out and share it. No matter what they've done, to give them kindness. Peter wrote, each one of us, everyone, say, that's me. That's Listen to this, if each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully, administering God's If anyone speaks, it should be speaking the, the, the very words of God. If anyone serves, it should do it with the strength God provides, not your own strength. It's there for you. Yes. So that all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. When God's yes. grace flows through us, he's glorified. Mm -hmm. That's how we glorify him. Amen. It's when we're active that way that we can say to people, they look at us and they say, how, how do you do that? Only by God's grace. Brad doesn't know I was going to do this, but I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to hear the story. I've heard the story twice and I could hear again and again and again. He spoke to the men about leadership and he talked about a situation. I'm going to set him up. So Brad, why don't you come up here? Mm -hmm. On his way, I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story. He was going down to Chicago. His job took him down to Chicago. He hated it. Hated the job. Hated it. Went to his supervisor, manager, and he said, uh, I, I like to take a different position. I, I just like it. And, and the man didn't say, well, I'll think about it. He said, no. So Brad, being a faithful employee, a good employee, just went back to work. But weeks went by, you know, he, just, he felt like, I can't stand this job. I can't stand it. Yeah. Went back to his boss, and he said, look, he said, I, I just would like to, not, I'm going to think about this. No. Brad stuck it out a little bit longer, and finally he realized, I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. And if he says no again, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. And so he went into his manager's office to ask again. So my uh, manager, um, he told me no twice, and I was thinking about quitting strongly. I was stressed out to the max, and I'd have to go to Chicago every Monday for this meeting, like uh, Bishop was saying. And so I walked in his office, after the meeting, there's another manager in there, and I said, Dave, we need to talk. And so he looked at the other manager who was in the office, he said, I, I, I need you to leave. So the first thought that came to my mind is, oh good, I don't have to quit, he's gonna fire me. <laughs> 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 and so, um, anyway, he told him to shut the door, shut the door. And um, I said, we need to talk. I want to go back to my other position as an engineer. I don't want to be a manager anymore. And thank Jesus. Thank you. He said, I told you no twice. He said, I know you want to transfer and do something different. He said, I've been watching you. And he said, the other managers have been watching you. So on the Monday morning meetings, I'd always get there early and people would start coming in the conference room early. And some of the guys would have pictures and things on their phone that is not good. Um, kind of huddling up, looking at things, talking about stuff that's not good. And um, Dave, my vice president I was just referring to, would fly up his girlfriend every weekend from Dallas to spend the weekend with him. And so he said, Brad, we've been watching you. 
He said, you would just walk away when we start saying things or doing things, showing things. He said, you, didn't, you weren't rude about it. You just walked away. Right. You yeah. didn't say anything. Yeah. And he said, the reason I kept saying no is we needed... We needed somebody with a light shining in our group. Jesus. He said, you don't know this about me. But he said, I used to go to church. I was raised in church. Mm. Been divorced twice. And he said, as you know, I have a girlfriend now. <coughs> and he said, your actions showed me what I needed to do, even though we have never talked about it. Mm. And I'm not saying that braggingly. No. Because it was a very stressful time of my life. That's why I get so emotional about it. But I also know what God was doing, even though I didn't know what God was doing in my life. I was thinking it's a terrible time in my life. This is horrible. God says it's a great time in your life and you don't realize it. A picture of grace. I'll go back to my text to begin with where Paul said this. He said, um, We can as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. I want to read the next verse. For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you. And in the house, I should be in, in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Preachers use this. I, I perhaps use it myself over the years, telling people, this is the time to make a decision for Christ if you don't know Christ. But he's writing to the church. Yes. He's, he's writing. This is a, the decision to know Christ. Amen. But this is a decision to use grace. Yeah. Now, to use God's purposeful, abundant, productive grace in your life. For you, you will live the best life ever having influence on all the people around you, directing people to God. Do you want to do that? Yes. Sure. Sure we want to do that. You do it there, that, but by doing it, you also glorify God. Yes. Let's stand together. Grace gives you direct access to me. This is what was purchased for you. Grace to come up that mountain. Not to be at the base as they did at Mount Sinai. This is a time of grace. Come into the secret place. I long to know you. Season, 
Now is the time. Now is the time of salvation. This is the day of salvation. Salvation, yes, it's the future, but God, we live the saved life. Now is the time to live that life, walking in grace. Praise God. Don't be afraid to go up to the mountain. Don't be afraid to come to an altar. Now is the time. Because grace is flowing right now. Praise God. Would you come? Praise God. Take some time to talk to him. Take advantage of the moment when His grace is just coming from the throne of grace. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus.